so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Tim Watson Munro has sat across from the worst of the worst. Rapists, terrorists, mass murderers. He's got to know them as people and not just criminals. Ask them about their childhoods, their families, the motivations behind what they did. Why did they do it? How did it make them feel? How do they feel now? Tim's a psychologist who started his career in the prison system as the resident psych at Parramatta Jail, before turning to the private sector, where he mainly worked for defence lawyers defending alleged crooks. He's assessed everyone, from Julian Knight, the man responsible for the Hoddle Street Massacre, to members of the family, a so-called doomsday cult. Assessing more than 30,000 clients and appearing as an expert witness in court more than 3,000 times has given him an interesting insight into the minds of some of Australia's most notorious criminals. But it's a job that took its toll over the years as he absorbed the horrors his clients had both experienced and perpetrated on others. And as he discovered over the course of his career, it's hard to get out the other side unscathed when you've been dancing with other people's demons. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. But for the next month, instead of looking at specific criminal cases, we're focusing in on the people behind the scenes of crime. Over the next few weeks, you'll hear from a former homicide detective, a psychic investigator and a crime scene cleaner. But today, you're going to get a glimpse at what it's really like to psychologically analyse some of Australia's worst criminals. I'm speaking with criminal psychologist Tim Watson-Munro. Tim, was psychology something that you were always drawn to as a kid, as a teenager? I've always been interested in people and when I was at university I found myself more often than not in the basement of the Fisher Library reading psychology books and it was about the dynamics of behaviour and all the rest of it. I thought about being a lawyer for a while but as it eventuated I ended up doing a master's degree in psychology. I graduated at the end of 77, early 78. Jobs were really hard to come by for psychologists then. It wasn't like it is now. It was a sort of fledgling profession. And I was living with a lady and she found this advertisement in a newspaper wanting a psychologist at Parramatta Jail. It was 78. I was 25 years of age. I didn't rate myself at all. But she said, you've got to have a crack at it. So I did. I applied for the job and lo and behold... I was offered the job at Parramatta Jail. Back then, worst jail in Australia by common agreement. Because maximum security, like. A multi-recidivist, high security jail. And in New South Wales, it was generally considered an end-of-the-line jail. By and large, the prisoners there were doing 10 to 15 years to life. Armed robbers, rapists, murderers, all these people. And so when I was offered this job, my friend said, don't do it. It'll change you. It's not for you. And I said, it's absolutely for me. It's such a challenge and an opportunity. And I grabbed it with both hands. I know in your time there, you worked on, you know, a number of notable rehabilitation projects. Yeah. But in your one-on-one sessions with prisoners, were there any common themes that used to come up? early childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the guys who I saw who became a kind of mate when he got out of jail was Bernie Matthews. And I remember one of the things he said to me early doors in the jail, he said, look, jails are universities of higher crime and the high schools are juvenile detention and so on. So the common theme was early childhood trauma, violence in the home, drinking in the home, a lack of supervision in the home breaking the law, 
And at some point, you know, the juvenile court saying, we've had enough and you're off to YTC, Youth Training Centre, and then they were just on the treadmill. The trajectory was almost inevitable that they'd end up in jail. Back then, there weren't a lot of drugs in jail. They really? were just starting to get into jails in the late 70s. What the crooks liked was home brew. Right. So they would steal pineapple peels and all this sort of stuff and mix it up and drink it on the weekends while they listened to the races. But the last year that I was there in 81, three guys were murdered in Parramatta Jail mm. all over drug wars. And you were only there for a few years, so that changed quite quickly. Quite a dramatic shift in that period of time. One of the interesting things I read in your memoir was that you dealt with a lot of heartbreak amongst these prisoners because they were dealing with, you know, marital issues or girlfriends or boyfriends that weren't with them because they were in prison, obviously. Well, it was a continuation of fractured relationships that started in childhood, broken families. And I was saying, A broken family means you end up in jail, but it certainly is traumatic for kids. They'd come to prison, partners would leave them, no contact with the children, but they weren't saints, all of these people. Well, some of them weren't, you know, and so the marriages were always pretty rocky when they were in the community, but it was the separation from family, I think, that was difficult for them to negotiate. I mean, typically within two years of doing a sentence, the relationship would end. They'd get a Dear John letter Mm. saying, you know, it's all over, Fred, see you later. And, of course, they're locked in their cells back then, probably 18 hours a day, no one to talk to. So that's where the role of the psychologist, I think, became quite valuable. But I guess the difference is, you know, when someone breaks up on the outside, you might be sad, you might cry, you might eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, but... Or two. (laughs) Or two. But inside, you know, these are guys that are used to anger and resorting to it. Did you have to kind of talk a lot of these guys down? Yes. The way I dealt with it, Parramatta Jail had an oval at the back of the jail. And I'd say, go and run around the oval three times and then come and talk to me. And inevitably, it wouldn't get rid of it all, but it would calm them down sufficiently that they could talk to you. A lot of them were in grief. They found it difficult to cope with even more rejection. And I think the the difference between being in the community where you can go out and have a drink with people, maybe meet someone else in due mm-hmm. course, in prison, the only connection they have with the community is often their family. So if those ties are severed, they're all alone and powerless and it's potentially a pretty tough time for them. Was it hard to connect with these men, many of who have done horrible things and you have to kind of befriend them to be able to get into their brains? It wasn't so much befriending. It was gaining their trust, I think. And yes, it was difficult, particularly in the context of the late 70s, where in the entire New South Wales prison system, I think there were 20 psychologists. Wow. That was it. That's it. Yeah. And so you had to deal with prison officers who thought you were a do-gooder and a crim lover and they didn't trust you. So you had to gain their trust as well. And you had to gain the trust of the crooks that you weren't going to be running off telling tales about them. And that took a period of time. What helped for me was with the prison officers, I'd play touch football with them after work sometimes. (laughs) I'd have a beer with them. They got to know me as a person and they could see, I guess, that I was all right. Eventually, they'd come to see me about their problems as well. With the prisoners, it was a bit different. I mean, it's a funny story, but I can remember there was a guy who came to see me in the first week or two because no one was knocking on my door. There was suspicion. Because I guess they would have seen themselves as weak coming to you. That's part of it too. And he came in, and it was during a brief period of my life that I smoked cigarettes. Gave them up years ago, decades ago, but... You were allowed to smoke in prisons then, and I had a packet of Benson Hedges, extra mild, in my shirt, and he could see the top, and I could see he was coveting it because uh, the prisoners got white ox, which, you know, it's just like smoking cow dung, (laughs) terrible tobacco, evidently. And I said, would you like one? Would you like a B&H extra mild? He said, oh, mate, that'd be great. And then I could see he was looking at the instant coffee in my office <laughs> because they had Gibson's Jailhouse. You can see where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> so cigarette, good coffee. We had a chat. 
he went away. He came back the next day and there were four other prisoners wanting to see me. It was exponential growth. And I realised it was all about the smokes and the coffee. But through that process, they got to know me and then, you know, I became very busy in the jail doing what I was doing. Well, they came to really kind of rely on you. Tell me about the time that you lost your keys. (laughs) (laughs) I drove a Honda Civic, you know. My pride and joy, first job after university when I bought a Honda Civic. I'd locked my keys in the car, parked across the road from the jail. So I went to the front gate. By then I knew the guys on the front gate. They were all pretty good blokes in their own way. And I said, can you put out a call over the PA asking anyone who knows how to break into a Honda Civic to report to the psycho's office? I was known as the psycho. The psycho. The psycho's office. So um, he did. By the time I got to my office, I had to negotiate this maze of locks and keys and checkpoints. There was a queue of about five or six blokes from memory. I said, come on in. And we then had like a group discussion about the best way of getting into the car with some, you know, different points of view. We got the keys out just like that, you know. Great story. It was utilising local talent to solve a problem. (laughs) You mentioned at the start of our chat that your friends had warned you against going into the prison, that Mm. it would affect you. Did it? I think it did, but I didn't realise the magnitude of it until later in my life and my career. I don't know that it was so much that experience. It was actually a very happy time of my life. I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the people I was working with. It was collegiate in a way. It was teamwork. And then I moved to Melbourne in 81, and I mentioned, you know, I'd surfed at Cronulla Beach, I lived in Balmain, I had a wide circle of friends, and I went from all that to Melbourne where I knew no one really beyond the guys working with uh, David Syme, and so I felt quite isolated and lonely. So that affected me, and then the nature of the work I was doing as well ultimately had an impact. One of the big cases, probably the breakthrough case for me, in Melbourne and Australia was Julian Knight. He was the Hoddle Street killer. You know, he massacred people in Hoddle Street back in August 87. And this case was referred to me. I was still very young, you know, I was like 34 years of age. And I was confronted with the biggest case in the country and the most horrific crime, really. He would have been one of the most dangerous people you'd come across well, at that point? As it eventuated, I've, I think I've met far more dangerous people than Since, Julian, yeah. but certainly the worst crime Australia had encountered. And I was so motivated, keen, over-involved really with what I was doing. I was privy to all the photographs. I spent a year talking to him. And that was the case that ultimately decades later I came to realise was the one that tumbled me emotionally because I I sort of developed symptoms, I think, of vicarious trauma through all of that. Were you hired by the defence to look into that? And can you take us through what is required of you in that instance? What do you have to do in the case of looking into or assessing Julian Knight? A letter of instruction, depositional material, brief of evidence. So you're forearmed with all this material. But it was an evolving case because I was briefed shortly after the massacre. I saw him out at Pentridge, I think, within two to three weeks of that event occurring. Were you nervous to meet him? No, I wasn't. I was full of sort of hubris and bullshit back then. And, you know, <laughs> I, I thought it was a big case and, you know, I could handle it. I'd worked in Parramatta Jail, yep. <laughs> all of that sort of stuff. But I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I thought he'd either just tell me to go away, uh, impolitely, or he would welcome the opportunity to speak to someone. As it eventuated, he was in the old Pentridge Hospital. He was just a bewildered 19-year-old, incredibly polite. He stood up. I can't recall if he saluted me, but he kept calling me sir because he'd come from Duntroon. Right. He'd spent time in the military in Duntroon, and he left in disgrace prior to Hoddle Street occurring. So I wasn't intimidated by him, but... The nature of what he had done was intimidating. Yeah. It's, you know, big case, terrible case. So it sounds like you spent hours upon hours of time with this man, Mm. hearing about his life and seeing the photos of what he'd done. 
Yes, I was too involved with it. And that was the sort of enthusiasm of relative youth and knowing that it was a big case and I had to do a really good job. I wasn't the only person who assessed him. David Symes saw him and there was another psychologist, Dr. Ken Byrne, who saw him. I'm not sure how it affected them, but uh, it certainly affected me. Not that I recognised it at the time. At the time, yeah. It was afterwards. Obviously, when you're in the prison, it's a completely different job to what you ended up doing once you moved to Melbourne. What is it like being in that court system as a psychologist? Because you're cross-examined and put on a stand to try and get stuff out of you. It is intimidating, particularly when I first started doing it. I went to Melbourne, I was 28, and there weren't many psychologists giving evidence in court then. I think there was four of us, including me. There's probably now about 4,000, you know. It's, it's, it's a specialty that's really taken off, but very different. You're not in an environment where you're working with others. You're very much a sole trader. If it's a collegiate environment, it's a brief one. So you get briefed by lawyers, similar to the night thing, a letter of instruction. Can you see this person? I see them. I interview them. You might administer psychological tests. You may speak to significant others in their lives to get some background, corroborative material or a different perspective on things. And then eventually put it all together and you write a report that's tendered in evidence. I think the most gruelling cross-examination in the sense of being slightly on my toes was Alan Bond, who was a client of mine years ago, Australia's largest corporate crook. He knocked off only a billion dollars. Only. Only a billion dollars from Bell Resources and did other things. And he had had open heart surgery to replace one of the valves in his heart. And subsequent to that, he was experiencing memory problems. And I was asked to assess him with others to get an adjournment because the lawyers couldn't get proper instructions from him. He kept saying, I don't remember. We wanted to know if that was genuine. What happened was I spent, I think, four days in the witness box in Perth and I was cross-examined. But it wasn't intimidating. It was just arduous. I mean, I've given evidence in other trials where I've been cross-examined for two or three days, wow. not often and not lately, but um, it's very tiring because you're just wondering where the left hook's going to come from. Yeah. And really, you're only as good as your last gig. If you get carved up in the witness box, word travels fast, particularly bad news, you know. So. It's a lot of pressure. Did you find yourself working ridiculous hours, making sure that your stuff was watertight because you knew that it was going to be picked apart? I worked very long hours, some weeks 100 hours, but it was... 100, 100 hours. hours? Well, that was not seeing people, it was doing reports and so on, but... With these cases, I became a person in demand and, uh, you know, I had a young family, I had mouths to feed, I needed to work to keep going. I'm, certainly back then I was a workaholic, so the whole process ultimately was exhausting and you need to put a lot of detail and time into what you're saying and you need to be prepared to swear up to it in cross-examination. When you are assessing a criminal or an alleged criminal, are there any techniques that you use, not to give away all of your secrets, but, you know, you hear about things like hypnosis and stuff like that? Did no, you use I don't anything? do that. No. Years ago, I was retained by the Victorian police on occasions to hypnotise witnesses when they were trying to get additional information about an offender or a crime. I have a qualification in hypnosis, but I haven't practised hypnosis for years and years, and I wouldn't do it now, but I, I would never do that when I was assessing a prisoner. The whole thing about this assessment, you have to get a really good clinical background history. And for a time, I was a visiting fellow at Melbourne University. They set up the first professional doctorate in forensic psychology, and I lectured in the psychological assessment of offenders for these doctoral students. And I would drill into them, you have to get a good history. It's the most important thing because there's so many clues in there that may be relevant to what the person has done now. And the way that you get a good history is, I guess, through experience, you know the right questions to ask, but it's all about developing rapport. If you don't have rapport, then they're, they're not going to tell you things. No. And to get rapport, you have to get their trust. And it is a skill. And I guess these days, I mean, I've been doing this more or less for 44 years. It's almost innate, but back in the day, it was a learning curve for me too. 
Using Knight as an example, I know you went very deep into his background and mm. childhood and time at Duntroon. Was there anything that you know surprised you about him and his psyche by the time he did what he did? A very high level of intelligence. Right. You know, he was Mensa material and IQ in the first top two percent or so from memory. Insightful, bright. The whole thing was a tragedy, primarily a tragedy for Melbourne and the victims and the families of the victims. But at a more subtle level, what a waste of a life, really. But he was always a troubled kid. He keeps in contact with me, although I haven't heard from him for a while. He's still in maximum security prison. He was given life with 27 years minimum, and that expired years ago. And they've now passed an act of parliament in Victoria, known, you know, euphemistically as a Julian Knight Act, where they've said he can't get out until he's considered too old, infirm, and unable to be a threat to society. So he may well, you know, spend another 10, 15 years, who knows, he may die in jail. I mean, he was 19 at the time, and, you know, decades have gone by, so he's way past middle age now. Do you think he's still a threat to society? No. But that said, I think more should have been done to progress him through the prison system. I mean, normally it's the rule of thirds, a third of your time is in maximum security, a third's in medium, then you go to a prison farm, you do education programs, you do therapeutic programs. He has spent the entirety of his sentence since 1987 when he was remanded on the night that he committed the offences in maximum security jail and no programs. Now you've got a guy with a high level of intelligence. I think the most useful job he's had for a time was sorting nuts and bolts in the jail. And there's various reasons behind that. And people are still, understandably, very angry with him. There's people out there that say, why would you give him anything? And, I, you know, I see where they're coming from. With a lot of these bad guys, in quotes, you know, the murderers, the rapists, the terrorists, all of that kind of thing, I think the public likes to think that there's something wrong with their brain, that they're a psychopath or there's some kind of reason as to why they've done what they've done. Is that as common as we think it is? Are prisons just full of psychopaths? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not all psychopaths. Yeah. I mean, a psychopath is an individual who has no empathy with others, and uh, no empathy, no remorse. Research suggests that they have a very high threshold for anxiety. So, you know, most people in the community, for various reasons, don't break the law. And one of them is the fear of the consequences. Psychopaths don't worry about consequences. So they're potentially very dangerous and clinically almost impossible to treat because without empathy and remorse, what's your starting point? If there's a complete denial of what's going on in your own head, how can anyone work on that? But not everyone in jail is a psychopath. I've met very good people doing time. They have made mistakes, they've learned from their mistakes, they've moved on and they get back into the community and you don't see them again. It's not that common, but it happens. I know the most asked question that you get is, what makes someone evil? <laughs> or are people just evil? Are they the psychopaths? Is that who we're putting in that bucket? I think you can be evil without being a psychopath. I mean, mm -hmm. some evil can be induced by drugs mm -hmm. and circumstances and anger. You know, I've seen a lot of people that do really evil things under the influence of ice. They don't think straight. It affects the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Consequential thinking, impulse control, all that stuff is affected by certain drugs. But to answer your question, I think that there are some people who are born evil. Is it nature? Is it nurture? I think by and large it's both. It's hard to put a percentage on how much of it you're born with and how much of it's created by your environment or how much your environment triggers that genetic predisposition. There's been interesting studies on identical twins, for example, separated at birth. One goes to an affluent home, the other doesn't. The one that doesn't is exposed to all sorts of brutality. The one that goes to the affluent home isn't. And yet some of them both end up before the courts and in jail. That's interesting because they have identical genes. And it would suggest that in some cases, environment doesn't have much of an impact on them. I might be generalising here, but it seems like 
of the people that fit into these kinds of categories, more are men. Of course, there are evil women out there, but there seems to be a higher percentage of men who commit murder. Do you think there's a reason behind that? Or am I wrong? Is it not just men? Well, I think on a statistical basis, you're right. There's more men in jail than women. But I've assessed women that have done very bad, evil things. You know, black widow killers, some women who have become involved in terrorist acts and so on, and uh, some women who organise hits on other people. So I don't think it's peculiar just to men, but certainly it seems that more men go to jail. Although, I don't know, maybe the dynamics are changing now. Could be. Do murderers or bad people try and trick you to get a... Good report. Yeah, and to use the insanity defence. Uh, Is it possible to trick you? Oh, look, we're all fallible. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, insanity is not used much as a defence now. It was very popular when the alternative was the hangman. So it's not used a lot. I saw a guy some years ago. There was no argument about his insanity. He killed his mother because he was convinced she was a witch. And, you know, there was a common consensus that he was mad. There wasn't even a hearing about it, really. There was just a bit of evidence led. But it's not a defence that you see often these days. I want to touch on some of your other clients that you worked with or patients that you worked with. Clients. Clients. I don't treat them, you see. They, yeah. they come to me for an assessment. I do a report, and unless they re-offend, and some of them do, you don't see them again. You worked with an alleged cult, the family, not the Hamilton Byrne family, but another group who also go by that name. And there were reports their treatment of children was potentially harmful. Can you tell me about your work with them? Where I became involved was quite interesting. I had been retained as it eventuated by the Victorian police. One disgruntled father had gone to them. He'd been part of this children of God thing. He'd wanted to get out, his wife didn't, and there were then all sorts of problems about access to the children. So he went to the police and made these claims. I was asked to assess the family, and essentially what I said was, look, they're quirky, but, you know, I could see no evidence of child abuse. People have a right to educate their kids at home as long as they're being educated, and, you know... It went from there. Then there was the raid, and then it eventuated. The police had buried that report of mine, and it came out that there had been a report prepared, and I was then retained by the lawyers representing these families to try and get their kids back. I assessed these people, same argument. They're different, but, you know, there are a lot of other people attached to different sorts of religions that have quirky views as well. And what happened was the the government capitulated. The kids were returned. It didn't go to trial. And the head of human services in Victoria resigned. So that was a big case as well. And it was a global case because the so-called children are gone. There were similar things occurring in the UK. And One of the reports I did was introduced in evidence to the House of Lords in London by one of the judges there who quoted what I'd said about it, and that was used as part of the argument to let these kids go back to their families as well. I spent a bit of time with them. You know, I went up to their accommodation, their homes, spoke with the parents, spoke with the kids. It's not a life I wanted, but, you know, (laughs) who are we to judge? Each to their own. Indeed. Not just in the case of the family, but is it, a very different experience for you assessing someone who is accused of a crime rather than someone who is a victim or an alleged victim in a crime? Is it a different kind of brain you have to turn on? I think that you've got to bring an objective mind to both scenarios and I don't go into an assessment of an offender judging them, particularly you know if they're pleading not guilty. It's not my role to be the moral police in all this, but inevitably, because you're a human, you have feelings, it does affect you. Similarly with victims, I mean, I have great empathy and compassion for these people. You treat them with great respect, you hear them out, and you support them as best you can. An interesting 
scenario around that is the Cottle Street case, Mm -hmm. where a number of lawyers who were acting for families of the victims and others approached me saying, look, we'd like to retain you to see these people. And I said, don't know that I can. You know, I'm, I'm assessing Julian Knight and I don't think that would be necessarily helpful to either parties. And they said, no, that's precisely why they want to see you because they want to have some understanding of what's going on with this bloke. But you're not allowed to share that, are you? Precisely. Uh, yeah. I said, I can't share that. It'll all come out in due course. I mainly work with offenders. You know, the second book I wrote, A Shrink in the Clink, I wrote a chapter about first responders and victims of crime. I mean, they get badly affected, victims of crime, and they need a lot of support. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro. We've skated around this, we've alluded to it, but I want to delve into it a bit more. By 1996, so 20 or so years into your career, you yourself were suffering from depression. Severe depression. Severe depression. And by the sounds of it through our chat that, you know, it had been in the background and then it kind of manifested. I think it had been percolating for a while, but I didn't recognise it. I was probably in denial. And one of the things you get with depression, a defence mechanism, is it's manic defence. So the more depressed you are, the harder you work to keep those feelings at bay. I did that and I also got into, you know, using cocaine as a means of self-medication. I had a lot going on at that time in my life. My first wife had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was raising kids. I was working 100 hours a week. And I was trying to deal with my own demons, hence Dancing with Demons as a book title. And I got into coke and it just escalated from there until 1999. And it all blew up. It became a matter of public knowledge. And it was a very difficult time. I know that even before you encountered these issues, you were seeing someone yourself. How did it feel to be in the other chair? It's a very good question. Looking back on it, I think it was a great thing to do. It, I think, enhanced my capacity to understand what it's like to sit on the chair. I never laid on the couch, but uh, (laughs) sit on the chair. And I had a terrific psychiatrist I was seeing. He was a professor of psychiatry. Sadly, he died too. I had a lot of loss. You know, my first wife died three weeks after the cocaine thing. My business partner died three weeks after that. And that was 99. And, you know, I went to court in late 99. I got a good behavior bond, no conviction. And I thought that I'd be able to unrealistically get on with my professional life. But I was then, you know, struck off for a bit over three and a half years. And uh, I used that time to reflect even further and have more treatment and all the rest of it. So horrible as that process was, I came out of it sort of stronger, wiser, and I think, you know, a better psychologist for it. Not that I'd recommend it as a way of learning lessons, you know, but um, I think, uh, you know, I've always been optimistic despite the depression. And I think, you know, you've got to learn from experiences. We talked about how you're in the other chair in terms of being in a psychologist's office or a psychiatrist's office, but you would have also been on the other end in terms of being outside of a courtroom and having media in your face and following you down streets and stuff like that. Well, that was sort of the sausage and potatoes of my professional life because they're big cases. I'd always, I was in the paper two or three times a week back then or on radio, TV. And then, of course, after I went to court, I was very grateful and relieved for the result. Mm. I went outside and it was just, you know, a sea of cameras and microphones following me down the street. It was an interesting sort of process, really. I can't imagine that helps the situation. It didn't help, you know, and um, but I anticipated it. It was a huge fall from grace. But at the time, uh, there were two things. I was relieved to have been given a good behaviour bond, no conviction, because that was very important. And the other thing, I was still in shock. You know, I was still, it was three months after I'd stopped using Coke. I'd gone through withdrawals and all that sort of stuff. But it takes a long time to fully recover from 
an addiction. And, uh, I mean, the common wisdom is two years of clean time, but this was three months after the event. So I was in a state of shock. I didn't really process all that stuff to the extent that I did subsequently, but it was not pleasant, you know. Something that I picked up in your memoir was you talking about how this is not exactly uncommon. I'm not talking about the cocaine use, but the the depression, the having mental health issues yourself as a professional when you do work in your field. Is that something that you find that a lot of people in the psychology field deal with? Well, the stats are telling, I think. You know, dentists, psychiatrists and psychologists have a high rate of suicide. I don't know if it's because of our innate sensitivities or whether it's the nature of the work we do. The nature of the work I've done since 78, more or less, has been very intense and black. You know, I'm dealing with really the detritus of humanity in many ways. And uh, inevitably, it's a process of osmosis. All this stuff creeps into your psyche and your soul. And back then, I didn't put up the boundaries that I have now. So I lived and breathed what I did as a psychologist for decades. It's very different now. I've got very strong boundaries. I'm now at a point in my career, I mean, I'm 69, you know, so I I take on gentler cases. <laughs> I'm happy seeing Bill from Borkham Hills, who's blowing point oh seven. <laughs> I'm very happy doing a few of those a day or a week. And the big cases, the murderers, the terrorists, the gangsters, I, I'm not really interested in doing anymore. And that's a self-survival thing. And I don't have the energy for it anymore, you know. Are there any boundaries, though, that you could have put in place back then that you think that would have helped not take on as much of that stuff? Oh, look, I think hindsight's, you know, wonderful. Yeah. But at the time, I didn't see it. And people said to me, you know, you should take a break. Maybe you should consider professional supervision. But, you know, again, it's the sort of hubris and arrogance of youth. I said, I don't know who's going to supervise me, you know. I have supervision now. It's not mandated. It's something I do. I talk to a clinical psychologist generally once a month, not about my issues, but more about the work process that I'm involved in. Because one of the things about private practice, if you work on your own, it's very solitary work. You go to the office, you hear all these histories, who do you debrief with? There's no colleague. There's no colleague. So I've created colleagues, you know, and I have this uh, supervision. Uh, you know, I'm up on my soapbox about this now because of what I went through. I say, you've got to do this. It's very important that you have some sort of professional supervision. In fact, I think it's now mandated for registration purposes. You've got to have some, you know, collegiate contact during the course of the year. And I think it's a very good thing. Over your career, you've assessed, I'm going to chuck some figures out here, more than 20,000 clients. I think it's closer to 30. <laughs> 30 I stopped counting clients? at 20. Gosh. You know, it's a lot of people, isn't it? <laughs> and you've appeared as an expert witness probably more than 3,000 times now. Oh, yeah, I have. Although I must say back then, you see, the, the process and dynamics have changed. Back then I was in court generally three to four times a week mm. because they would call me to give evidence to articulate what I'd said in the report and give it another dimension. And the courts had time to do that. You know, sentence hearings were generally took half a day, even for trivial things. Now, because of the volume and the pressures, you're really called to give evidence in person. It's generally done on the papers, unless the Crown has an issue with what you've said in your report. So I don't go to court that much in the criminal jurisdiction now, but I do a lot of work now with refugees and people that have come to Australia who are being potentially deported because they've broken the law. Every one of those cases I now give viva voce evidence, you know, I give evidence in person. But it's a different dynamic. It's more inquisitorial, it's more respectful, and I think as a social justice issue, it's more valuable for me to be doing that now. Given the decades that you have worked in the industry and the amount of people that you have spoken to, has it taught you anything about humans that we <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question but has it you know not just criminals but the way our brains work I guess you kind of touched it on it before when you said you know everyone has a different story look I've learned a lot about humanity and I've learned a lot about people I mean one of the things going back then 
was I became a very protective father. You know, I have five children. You know, <laughs> they've all said to me, you've mellowed. And, you <laughs> You're know, a bit of a strict dad, were you? Do you remember back then when you were just so kind of thingy about who we were with and where we went? And I say, yes, I do remember that. And they said, we're grateful for that. We understand it now as adults. And this is in the context of Melbourne in the 80s, 90s, when Mr. Cruel was around. Mr. Cruel was a guy who was breaking into houses and abducting free post-pubescent girls. Mm. And, you know, I was involved in profiling him. I was often quoted in the press. And I was concerned that he may make my children a target to make a point of all this. So I was naturally very protective. And I have mellowed, but I'm still a little bit sceptical about human nature. You don't lose those kind of skills and that learning. And for me, it's intuitive. I'm trying to see the world in brighter colours these days. (laughs) And I basically do. That black kind of cloud that followed me for a long time when I was severely depressed is gone. I'm not depressed anymore. I'm happy. I enjoy my life. But, you know, I've learned a lot too. You know, 44 years you'd have to, wouldn't you? (laughs) What about the public perception of psychologists? You mentioned at the start of our chat there was like 20 people out there that were doing what you were doing and now they're everywhere. Well, you know, when I went to Melbourne, there were four people in the courts. Myself, a bloke by the name of Ian Joblin, Bernard Healy, Ken Byrne, and a really good guy, Jeff Cummins, and we were getting the lion's share of the work. And then they started bringing in professional doctorates, masters, specific master's degrees in clinical and forensic psychology and so on, and then there was agitation with the government. So long story short, psychologists now get rebates if they're treating people. There's a greater acceptance, I think, certainly in the courts of psychological evidence than there may have been back in the the early 80s. You know, at times I would encounter difficult judges. Things like, well, psychologists are to psychiatrists as dental technicians are to dentists. Wouldn't you say so? And I'd say, no, I wouldn't say that. And I'd walk them through why they were wrong. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. I think there's a much greater acceptance in the community of what we have to offer and what psychologists have to offer is a great deal to the community. But has the court system kept up with that? Do you think that they're structured in a way that supports your evidence or your work? Or Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I think that there's a greater acceptance, the scepticism, the cynicism of years gone by. And it wasn't all judges, but certainly there was some like that. But when they got to know you and they listened to the quality of what you were doing or otherwise, it was not so bad. I made the comment in the past, you know, it's not for the faint-hearted, this type of work, and it's beyond the client stuff which we've discussed, but the whole process of going to court, giving evidence, and dealing at times decades ago with cantankerous judges, that's another layer of stress altogether. But if you couldn't cut the mustard, you didn't survive. It was as simple as that. Though People go off and do other things. But I think the courts are far more accepting of psychologists, their expertise, their training, provided you're not silly in what you say. Step beyond the boundaries of your expertise. And I've seen people do it. It was one of the things I used to stress on my doctorate students, stick to your knitting. If you don't know something, say, I don't know. It's way better than pretending that you do and then getting you know, carved up, which inevitably will occur. Thanks to Tim for joining us on today's episode. You can find a link for Tim's books, Dancing with Demons and A Shrink in the Clink, in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Barth, with audio design by Madeline Joannou. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. I'll be back next week with another look behind the scenes of crime. Talk to you then.